Characters normally get third level spells at level 5, and it's one of the biggest power increases that spellcasters get, because of just how good pretty much all of the 70 plus third level spells are. So in this list we'll be going over the 10 best of them, generally based on how useful they are. And at number 10 we have Spirit Guardians. This is a spell which can only be learned by clerics, or classes that can steal cleric spells, which basically creates a 15 foot radius area effect for 10 minutes, which deals 3d8 damage to enemies and cuts their movement speed in half, and allows you to designate allies to be immune to its effects. There are very few AoEs that allow you to not damage allies, so this is always a big plus to mention. And this spell damages enemies the first time they enter it on a turn, or if they start their turn inside of its radius. However, a distinction to made is that it only deals damage if they enter it, and not if you move the effect to them. Now, what makes this spell good is the fact that it's able to do a lot of long-term AoE damage, as if you're able to get the damage two times to an enemy target, then that's equivalent of hitting them with a single fireball in damage, which is kind of the max when it comes to damage at this level from a spell. Although, there are a lot of downsides to Spirit Guardians. The biggest one is definitely the concentration factor. You have to concentrate on the spell and it has a short 15 foot radius. So, the power of the spell is in its longevity, and if you just get attacked by creatures and drop Spirit Guardians before you're able to deal its damage twice, then it's kind of a lackluster third level spell. And since you have to be so close in order for it to work, there's a good chance you'll have lots of enemies in range attacking you in order to try to make you perform concentration checks. So unless you're just really geared out into making Spear Guardians as useful as possible, like taking Warcaster or Resilient Constitution, or if your DM is just nice and doesn't attack your character, then it's going to be hard to actually keep Spear Guardians up for more than a turn against a group of enemies. Although, the potential damage of this thing is really good, because you cast it once and you basically have a passive AoE, which is going to be dealing damage for the entire encounter assuming everything in rage doesn't break your concentration, of course. Which means you can also cast other spells on your subsequent turns, while still gaining the advantage of Spirit Guardians that you cast on turn 1. And the speed decrease from the ability stacks with difficult terrain, as it simply cuts their speed in half, so it's a pretty good third level spell and a lot of people take it as a priority if they're playing clerics, because of just how much damage it can potentially do over the course of an entire combat encounter. Although in my experience, combat encounters don't usually last long enough for Spirit Guardians to deal massive amounts of damage, and unless your DM is really nice about creature placements, they're probably not going to end their turns close to a cleric using this ability. So it takes a lot of position in order to get the full effect out of it. But it's one of those effects which is kind of worth trying to get the full effect out of it. And at number 9, we have the Fly spell. This spell simply gives a creature you touch a fly speed of 60 feet for the duration of the spell, which is 10 minutes. And if you upcast the spell, you can target more people, so you can potentially have your entire party flying with the spell, which is sometimes a necessity. You see, fly speed in D&D is actually super valuable, as being able to fly out of combat allows you to break a whole bunch of encounters, and being able to fly in combat has a lot of benefits as well. Although that kind of brings up the downside to fly, and why it's only the number 9 spot on this list. The fly spell requires your concentration. So, if you're using it in combat, and get attacked while you're in the air, there's a chance you'll lose concentration and just fall out of the sky. Although there are some enemies which straight up do not have ranged attacks, like most beasts and funny enough the 5e Tarask. So, using the fly spell is tantamount to being immune to damage from those creatures, which is a pretty strong thing to gain from a third level spell seen as the ability to become immune to damage is actually the function of a 9th level spell. And since fly speed is so useful, having a spell that just allows you to do it is just also very useful. Which is why the fly spell has to take one of the spots at the top 10. Even if it's not the most useful thing in combat, flying is usually very useful outside of combat, where the concentration requirement doesn't matter as much. A few examples could be, if you're in a dungeon and there's a whole bunch of spikes on the floor or just traps, you can just fly above the ground in order to guarantee you don't trigger anything. If there's a broken bridge, you can just fly to the other side or slowly carry everyone else across, or carry over rope in order to create a makeshift bridge. If you're being chased by someone, you can just fly on top of a building, and unless they can fly too, there's not much they can reasonably do to climb and chase after you fast enough. Or if you're out in a big opening and you're just being attacked by a whole bunch of things and you need to run away, you can just fly out of there and leave all your party members behind. Because as soon as you get 60 feet into the air, that kind of outranges a lot of thrown weapons, where they can only hit you if they have bows or long range spells. 
A lot of the official modules are not balanced around flying either, and it allows you to trivialize a lot of encounters. There's also the fact that it just gives you a higher speed than normal, so it's incredibly useful to be able to fly, and definitely worth the spell slot if you don't have flying in some other way, like through a racial or magic item. Especially since you can grant this effect to other party members and not just yourself. And at number 8, we have Liamin's Tiny Hut. This is a spell with a 1 minute cast time, which allows you to create a 10 foot radius dome, which allows you to house yourself and up to 9 other party members, just as long as their size is medium or smaller. Which all player characters are, since there isn't an official race which allows you to become a large creature. This spell lasts for 8 hours and doesn't require concentration. It makes it so creatures outside the area that you didn't designate are not allowed to come inside the barrier, nor can they attack or use spells on anyone inside the barrier. Although technically, a dragon's breath is not considered an attack or spell, so they can definitely fry you while you're trying to hide inside a tiny hut. Although pretty much everything else is basically just not going to be able to attack you while you're inside the hut. And while you're inside the hut, you're not allowed to use spells on anyone outside the hut either, but you are allowed to move objects through it, which means if you have a bow and arrow, you're able to shoot creatures from outside the hut without fear of retaliation. Although, since the hut has a 1 minute cast time, this isn't really something you can do mid-combat in order to become immune to damage while you attack things with a bow. It's kind of something that requires a lot of setup beforehand. Or just one that happens if you're attacked while trying to take a long rest. Which is the main benefit of Liam's Tiny Hut. Generally, just use this thing before you take a long rest. If you're in a dangerous area, like the middle of the wilderness, inside a dungeon, or one of the nine layers of hell. You lay down Liamid's tiny hut, and then can comfortably long rest for 8 hours. Be able to see outside the hut, since it's completely transparent to you, and if there are creatures outside, you won't have to deal with them until the spell ends. Or unless one of the creatures outside has a way to dispel the hut. Although very few creatures in the monster manual have the ability to cast dispel magic. So you're fine for the most part, unless you long rest near Yunagu. And at number 7, we have Mass Healing Word. This is a spell that can only be used by bards or clerics, and as a bonus action allows you to cast Healing Word on up to 6 targets within 60 feet. And Healing Word is an absolutely amazing first level spell, because it basically allows you to heal a target at range with a bonus action. And Mass Healing Word is just the evolved version of that. Although there are a couple of problems with Mass Healing Word when compared to just its first level counterpart. Generally, the best use of Healing Word is to use it on a down party member that's unconscious but not yet dead as it will bring them back into the combat. Mass Healing Word requires a much higher level spell slot, and is generally not worth using over the first level spell slot, unless you have multiple party members down. As just using the ability to heal a party member who is low on health isn't really worth it, because it doesn't heal enough where it's really that impactful, as it's only 1d4 plus your spellcasting modifier. So if you have a modifier of plus 5, and you roll a maximum of a d4 on that roll, then you're only healing everyone for 9 hit points. So, the best use of the ability is definitely to yo-yo heal a lot of down party members. Or just provide healing to everyone while trying to get up a down party member. And since it's also a bonus action which heals multiple people, it's a pretty valuable heal. In a campaign I ran, I had one of my enemy characters with mass healing word. And it made the fight way more deadly than it probably should have been, because that one character kept just bringing all of their allies back into the battle with yo-yo healing. That was until my players got brutal and just started killing all the down characters. In 5e, there isn't an official penalty for just going unconscious and then coming back with just any amount of healing. So, Mass Healing Word is just a really good way to make use of that. As if multiple party members go down, you don't have to pick one of them in order to bring back into the battle. Assuming you have a third level spell slot available, of course. And at number 6, we have Lightning Bolt. This is a pure blasting spell that deals 86 lightning damage to all targets in a 100 foot line. And this is tied for the most amount of damage that a spell can do at the 3rd level. And in fact it's so good, that it kinda beats out a lot of 4th and 5th level spells in damage as well. There's only one other 3rd level spell in the game which comes close to it in damage, besides the one that's tied with it in damage, and that's Lightning Arrow, which is basically a single target spell. So Lightning Bolt's AoE damage can beat out Lightning Arrow's single target potential, although that's a baseline Lightning Arrow not counted in any modifiers, but you get the point. Lightning Bolt is a massive damage dealing ability. Although since it only goes in a straight line, it is kind of hard to hit all of your enemy targets with it, or to even hit a couple of them. So it's not as valuable as the other spells which can also deal the same amount of damage at this level, which I'll be talking about a little bit later on this list. However, since it is in a line, it's a lot easier to maneuver than some of the more AoE focused spells, without worrying about hitting your party members. 
And also, since it does hit really hard, you could give it to one of your NPCs if you're a GM, if you want one of your NPCs to have a very dangerous spell to have, but not something which can wipe out the entire party too easily either. And at number 5, we have Hypnotic Pattern. This is a control spell which can target creatures in a 30-foot cube, where if all of those creatures fail their wisdom save, they become charmed, incapacitated, and their speed is reduced to zero. And then they just kind of stay like this for the full duration of the spell, which is one minute. Now, what makes this better than a lot of the other control spells at lower levels, or even at this level, is that there's no other saves past the first one. Usually, when a spell will control someone for multiple rounds, it allows the target to perform an additional save at the end of each of their rounds, but not Hypnotic Pattern. If they fail once, then they have the potential to be controlled for a full minute. And the only other way to break Hypnotic Pattern is if the creature takes any damage, another creature uses an action in order to shake them awake, or if you drop your concentration. So, with the big 30-foot cube the Hypnotic Pattern takes up, it is possible to just completely disable an entire enemy team which can allow your teammates to better position themselves in order to just blast them in order to break the effect. Or just get past them if they don't want to take the lethal option. However, if you don't hit everyone with it, it's easy for some DMs to just metagame the spell, and they'll have an NPC party member immediately try to shake away everyone else in hypnotic pattern to end it quicker. Although, even that requires a full action by the creature per person, so it's still wasting other creatures' turns in order to accomplish this feat. Hypnotic Pattern is just a beast of a control ability, which is even usable at higher levels of play, as the effect is pretty much good in all tiers. So it's just a good spell to pick up if you need an emergency control an entire group of enemies. Or if you accidentally hit one of your party members, you can just gently shake them awake with an action so they can get back into the battle. And at number 4, we have Revivify. This is a spell which costs 300 gold to cast each time you use it, which basically allows you to bring one creature back to life, just as long as they died within the last minute. The creature brought back will only have one hit point, and it doesn't work on any creature which died of old age, nor does it restore any missing body parts. Although the best use of Revivify is using it immediately after combat is over in order to bring someone back to life, who maybe was unfortunate and died and failed their death saving throws mid-combat, which is something that comes up pretty often in the average game. And just having someone in your party with a Revivify spell just puts a lot of other party members more at ease, as they know they probably won't permanently lose their character due to a few unlucky rolls, or just taking out in a combat encounter they weren't expecting to be so difficult. It's also a useful spell if you just need to keep an important NPC alive, as the ability to bring someone back to life has pretty much been useful in every single game that I've ever ran. Although, since the ability is basically a fail state from a failure state, it only exists in case things actually go wrong. So, if nothing ever goes wrong in any of your campaigns, then you'll never use the ability. So it could end up being a wasted use of a spell that you know. Although, generally, the ability to bring things back to life is general enough, where it's worth having something like Revivify in order to rectify that situation, and you're probably better off if you never have to use it anyway. And at number three, we have Counterspell. This ability is pretty simple. Using your reaction when you see another creature within 60 feet of you casting a spell, you can stop that spell from being cast, and fail without having any effect. So when an enemy is trying to teleport away, you can use counter spell in order to stop that. However, if they're using a spell of a higher level than third level, then you have to perform an ability check in order to make sure your counter spell succeeds, or upcast counter spell at a higher level in order to make sure it succeeds. Because Counterspell just allows you to stop spells from happening, it's generally used in all tiers of play, and is regularly used in high level games as well, even though it's a third level spell. The ability to just be able to counter a spell is just very good, even if there aren't a lot of monsters in the monster manual that can actually cast spells. And it doesn't work on innate spell casting. Although, funny thing to note with Counterspell is that you can Counterspell a Counterspell. So if there's enough mages in a room, you might have to go through a full chain of negates before you're able to find someone who's successful in casting a spell. As you can also counterspell a counterspell if an enemy caster is trying to counterspell your spell. Since it's just a reaction spell and doesn't actually mess with any of the rules for how you cast your spell on a turn or the rules of using a bonus action while casting a spell. Just as long as you have a free hand in order to perform the somatic component of the spell. And that the other spell you're casting doesn't require both of your hands for whatever reason. And at number two, we have Conjure Animals. This is a spell that basically allows you to summon a bunch of animals to fight for you for up to an hour, or until you lose concentration. 
and the way you conjure animals is kind of up to you, as you can choose either 1 CR2 beast, 2 CR1 beast, 4 CR1 half beast, or 8 CR1 quarter beast. And how this ability works as rules as written is the person who uses the ability gets to choose which of the four options they want to summon. And then it's up to the DM to determine which creatures are actually summoned through the ability. As unless a spell specifically states that you're allowed to pick specific creatures, then it defaults to the official rules, which is just for the DM to pick for you. Because if you're able to summon eight giant poisonous snakes, then you're able to deal around 125 damage on average with all those snakes, which is equivalent to how much damage a CR 20 creature is able to deal in one turn. So you have the potential to just deal way more damage than any other spell possibly can at this level, to a single target anyway. A lot of the AoE spells can technically deal more damage if they just hit more targets. And there's also the fact your Dia might not give you eight giant poisonous snakes. They might give you something else, like eight wolves or eight giant badgers, for example. And both of those are pretty good options too. Basically, no matter which beast your DM picks for you, you're going to be doing a ton of damage with the spell, to the point where it's kind of overpowered. You do have to roll for all the creatures in initiative, so they don't get to all go immediately after your turn like a lot of the other summon spells, which is one of the big problems of the ability. If one player uses Conjure Animals, then half of the combat is going to just be all those animals attacking things, which can significantly slow down an encounter. Or speed it up since you'll be doing so much damage with all the summoned creatures that you'll probably kill whatever you're fighting pretty quickly. The other problem with the ability is its concentration requirement, where it's pretty easy for a DM to counter this ability by just targeting the person who controls the animals, that way they drop concentration and all the animals disappear. And while the best way to use this spell is to summon a whole bunch of CR 1 4th creatures, you could make this significantly easier to control by just using one of the higher CR options, even if you don't have the action economy with just a single CR 2 creature or two CR1 beasts, for example. Although if you allow the player to choose which beast they summon, this ability is one of the strongest spells in the game, until you get to high tiers of play where the beast you summon just won't be able to hit the armor class of higher level creatures, or most of them will just be immune to the beast's damage, unless you're a shepherd druid. And at number one, we have Fireball. This is a spell with a 150 foot range that deals 8d6 damage to all targets within a 20 foot radius, which is the same damage as a lightning bolt. And as we went over in the Lightning Bolt section, 8d6 damage is the most amount of damage at this spell level, and higher than a lot of damages from the 4th and 5th level spells as well. And Fireball is kind of the reason why a spellcaster pops off when they hit level 5, and that's because Fireball allows you to basically instantly win encounters by itself. Hypnotic Pattern does allow you to control a whole bunch of creatures in a 30 foot cube, although the best way to control creatures is just to kill them, and Fireball's radius is even bigger. Fireball has an absolutely ridiculous range and radius. You can hit something from further away with a fireball than you can with the 100 foot line of lightning bolt, and potentially just hit more targets. And part of the reason fireball is above something as overpowered as conjured animals is because you can just as easily get rid of an entire group of enemies with just a single fireball as you could by summoning a whole bunch of giant poisonous snakes, and with a quarter amount of the time and effort too. In fact, you could probably do it way more easily too, as simply hitting five creatures with fireball deals more potential damage than eight giant poisonous snakes in a round. And you're more likely to actually deal damage to all five of those targets than with each of those eight giant poisonous snakes having to land one of their attacks. Although in a single target scenario, Conjured Animals wins hands down. But D&D combat generally has more than one target to fight, so it's most likely to be more usable in more situations, even if the ridiculously large radius is kind of unruly when trying to not hit your party members as well. Now, there is a pretty big downside to Fireball, and the fact that it deals fire damage. And there are a lot of creatures in the game who resist or are just immune to fire damage. So there are some campaigns in which his damage is probably useless, like Descent into Avernus. Although if the damage of Fireball is working just fine, then it's a no-brainer blaster spell which will probably solve most of your problems. Alright, and that's the list. When preparing for this video, I kind of went over all of the 70 plus third level spells and ranked them, so I'll probably make a part two going over the second best third level spells as well, because there's a lot of interesting things to talk about there. But anyways, if you have any ideas for future videos just like this one, I'd love to hear about them down in the comments.